Good evening, everyone out there. It's, um, it's good to see you all. Glad you survived the rain to come on in. You know, when I lived in Barbados and in the island, I lived there for nine months. And when it would rain, no one would do anything. No one would get out of their house. And when they, they would, if they had to go to their car, they would put their hand over their head uh, because of the rain. It was like they would melt or something. But you all are hardy New Englanders, aren't you? Rain is going to hold you back. It's great to, uh, great to see everybody. If you're a guest, welcome to Forestdale Church. My name is Ethan. I'm the pastor here. And I um, want to point out that this Wednesday night, we have our members meeting. And on the back table by the treats, you'll see an agenda for our meeting. So you see a couple bullet points that we're going to go over at our members meeting. It'll be right here in the church at 630 on Wednesday night. We won't be voting on anything, but we will be catching up on a lot. And so it'll be a good way to keep updated with what is going on. We'll have a time of, also, of q and If you have any questions or concerns or any encouragements, anything you'd like to share with the church members and the elders, um, just let us know. And we'll be happy to discuss anything that's on your mind. But also we want to celebrate. We want to take this time as, as members to celebrate the Lord's faithfulness and his goodness to us, to carrying us through to get to another members meeting. Uh, from, you know, we just in the last, from you look at the last members meeting, we had all this time since then, how much has happened and how many good things has the Lord given and shown to us. Um, we want to celebrate those things together as a church family. If you're not a member, you're actually welcome to come to those meetings. Chuck will make sure you're quiet though. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> you're, you're, you're welcome to attend and actually, participate John, John with us. White. Yes, yeah. Um, we have uh, offering plates in the back. We don't pass plates during the service, but um, we do collect tithes and offerings and gifts that people give. Um, you can place any tithes or offerings you have in the back. Along with those, you can also place a prayer card. If you have a prayer request, something that's on your heart, please let us know. Uh, we're a church of prayer. We love praying. I love praying. And um, I have, uh, I write things down when I'm in my office and I think about what concerns are there in the church right now that I can start my day and just give them to God. You get on that list when you turn in a prayer card. So please uh, give me an excuse uh, to pray for you, big or small uh, things. Thank you so much for those who do give to our church. There's three ways you can give. You can do all three ways too if you want, or you can just pick one. You can give uh, in person here, cash or check, uh, you can mail a gift to the church, or you can give online. If you go on our website, you can find the, the link there to give. So thank you so much for those who give and for um, keeping the lights on, keeping staff here, and keeping our ministry going out to our community. Well, let's take a moment now just to quiet our hearts before the Lord. Uh, we see this every week, uh, God's call to worship on all creation to come and to worship him, to see him in his glory. You know, we all come to church for different reasons, but we're reminded of the one reason that we actually are supposed to be here, and it's to glorify God. So in a way, sometimes we need to repent. We need to repent at this time to say, God, I came here for different reasons that actually aren't the reason that I ought to be here, and that's to glorify you, to see your glory as your word proclaims it, and to be transformed by it when we hear from you. So let us quiet our hearts now before the Lord to prepare ourselves to respond to his call to worship. Please stand with me as I read our call to worship, found in Psalm 96, verses 7 through 9. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth.
how great, how great is our God. Amen. Father God, you are truly a great and mighty God. We are so honored that we can come to you and just praise you and to open our hearts to you and to lift our hands to you. You are just mighty and sovereign in all things. And we are just so grateful that you love us and that you choose us and that we can come before you and cry out to you, Abba, Father, Lord, that we know the sweetness of being called your child and how blessed we are to just be able to come into your holy presence. Kids, you're dismissed for Children's Church. You can make your way downstairs. If you're junior high, you can go over to the uh, church office building. And at this time, we're going to have uh, one of our elders, Ben, come up for a community prayer. There we go. Will you please join me in prayer? Father God, I just... I'm so grateful. You really are a great God. You are sovereign in everything you do. We are trustworthy. You are reliable. We know that we can go to you for um, protection, for safety, for comfort. And we are just immensely grateful for that. We thank you for all the ways that you've blessed us. We thank you that we're able to join together um, publicly without fear and be able to worship you and to 
sing songs and to read from your book and to just share with one another the things that you've been doing in our lives. We thank you that we don't have to be afraid or concerned or we're just grateful that we can do these things and that you've given us the, the place and uh, a country that lets us do these things and for that we're very grateful. And for some reason you have chosen us, a bunch of broken people who make mistakes, people who rebel against you on a regular basis. Um, we just we're overwhelmed with your grace and your, your mercy that you've shown us. Lord, I just want to lift up a couple of groups of people. I want to lift up uh, first responders. Lord, I pray that you'll just be with them as they go about doing the things that, uh, that they've been called to do, uh, saving lives and putting themselves at risk for other people's sake. Also, I want to lift up uh, the missionaries that we support, uh, both overseas and here at home. I pray that you will uh, bless them and keep them safe, but not keep not, but not keep them safe at the expense of the gospel. I pray you just be with us tonight, and you will open our hearts and our minds to what Ethan has to say. I pray that you will uh, give him boldness and a desire to uh, speak the truth, and that he will deliver it with uh, with the, the passion that you've given him. I ask all these things in your name. Amen. We're going to be reading out of Psalms, uh, chapter 1, and through the entire thing. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight it, it is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Ben. Well, it's uh, good to be back here to uh, deliver sermons. Again, I, I, you know, I always enjoy the rest away, but it just makes me more eager to get back to it. Loved hearing Ben a couple weeks ago, Psalm 42, and then last week with um, Dave Robbins. We are um, going to be beginning, uh, going to be beginning a new sermon series through the through the Psalms. It's going to take us uh, through different Psalms uh, through Thanksgiving. And um, I'm gonna make. I'm gonna double check that this is on. I'm I'm on and I'm not muted on my mic. Um, I'm gonna have to pull a George Whitfield maybe and just talk loud. So uh, we want to think about uh, prayer as we lead into the Christmas season beforehand. I mean, I think that's a great fall thing: um, gratitude, prayer, thankfulness. Prayers can be known as um, just conversing with God, having a conversation with, talking to God. But there's nothing more awkward than hearing crickets in a conversation, is there? Being with someone you don't really know that well and struggling to find something to say. Do you ever wonder what those crickets are saying as they're watching you two? They're saying, gee, this is, this is, this is difficult. This is brutal. That's what they're saying to each other as they're watching you finding it hard to come up with something to say to this other person. Why? Why is clumsy conversation so awkward? Well, because conversation connects us. So when we're finding it hard to converse, what really is happening is we're finding it hard to connect to the other person. In the past, I felt this way in conversation, talking to my father-in-law or talking to a girl in high school or maybe trying to find a, a way to talk to somebody 
that I really admire, that I never thought I would actually be able to talk to in meets. Conversations can be awkward when you don't know each other well. But the ironic thing is, in order to know someone well, you've got to talk to them. You've got to have conversation. The best of friends are the ones who talk the most. The worst of friends are the ones who have stopped talking long ago. Yet there's still more to it than that. For example, just because you talk a lot to somebody doesn't mean you're close to them. It's called talking past someone. Using them as a listening portal. Just because you like to talk a lot and you need to get your fix. All the while never connecting with the actual person that you're talking to. Because you're, well, you're really not talking to them. You're talking past them. You have no concern for them personally or their ideas or what they might say if they had a second to say something. Only for yourself. Your purpose is simply to say what you want to say. So it's not merely talking that connects us, but conversation. The Christian practice of prayer can be simply defined as conversing with God. And it's in conversing with God that our relationship with God can grow closer and closer and stronger and stronger. But some of us struggle to pray because we don't know God that well. Others of us struggle to pray because we don't really know what to say. Others of us think we're close to God because we talk to him all the time all the while actually never connecting to him because we're not really talking to him. We're talking past him. So when it comes to connecting with God in conversation, how should we pray? Well, the disciples asked Jesus this very question in Luke chapter 11. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he taught them a simple prayer that actually covers a variety of items. This prayer has been prayed countless times for over 2,000 years, ever since he first taught them to pray. I'm positive many of you have memorized this prayer that he taught them to pray, and some of you might not even realize you have it memorized. Jesus taught us to pray so that we can connect with God. I remember it wasn't too long ago, maybe a few months ago, coming to my office on a Monday morning, ready for a day's work, knowing I need to pray before I do anything. But being so tired that I didn't really want to pray. I didn't know what to pray. I didn't know how to pray in that moment. It would have been easier to just open my email and get, get on with it. But then I remembered a prayer, the Lord's Prayer. I said, my father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done today in my day. On earth as it is in heaven, give, give me my daily needs. Give me my daily bread today. Forgive me of my debts as I forgive those uh, who are debtors to me. And lead me not into temptation today. Would you deliver me from evil? And wow, did that bring strength to my, to my life in that moment? A time when I was too weary to pray. I didn't know what to pray. I could pray what the Lord taught me to pray. And it's brought such life to me that I, I, I thought I could have overlooked this and thought this a mundane, childish ritual. But in that moment, it was a powerful force in my life that carried me through uh, that day. Yet despite for so many of us knowing this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, how much of us still would say that we struggle to pray? How many of us would still say we experience even seasons of prayerlessness in life? Or that we don't feel that prayer is very effective or meaningful? Psalm 1, as Ben read, paints a picture of God's word flowing through the channels of someone's spiritual life, bringing vitality and strength through every season, through the high points and the low points, without fail. And I think we can tie that idea to prayer. 
When God's word flows through the channels of our prayer life, it brings vitality and strength to us spiritually. So for the next six weeks, we're going to be in the Psalms. Today is going to be an overview sermon of prayer and the Psalms in general. So forgive me for not expounding Psalm 1, uh, the rest of uh, this sermon. But for the next five sermons, we'll look at one particular Psalm, dig into it, and see how it actually teaches us how to pray the Lord's Prayer. Jesus taught us what to pray. The Psalms show us how to pray. The main point I want to show tonight is this, that because the Psalms show us how to pray, our connection with God can grow like a tree by streams of water. Because the Psalms show us how to pray, our connection to God can grow like, uh, like a tree that is planted by streams of water. Two qualities that the Psalms bring to our spiritual life. Vitality and strength. Vitality is just another word for life. It gives life and then strengthens our life. So first, vitality. The Psalms are vital for our spiritual health. Not prayer in general. Prayer in general is vital for our spiritual health. But the Psalms specifically are vital for our spiritual health. Let me try to prove that to you. First, Jesus prayed the Psalms. Jesus prayed the Psalms. Uh, when I lived in South Africa for a year, I attended an Anglican church that year. First time ever attending an Anglican church. There, but there was an Anglican in their name, so they kind of tricked me in a way uh, to attend their church. They seemed like any other church. Their building was modern. Their pastor didn't wear any special clothes. They sang similar songs to the ones that I've always sung in church. Their preaching was biblical and quite powerful. Their fellowship with one another was very genuine. Joy brought them through the rest of their week where they wanted to spend time together. But then there was the prayers that tipped me off. The prayers. Each Sunday, we would pray a prayer of confession. And I mean that literally. The church would pray a prayer of confession that was on the screen. We'd all say it out loud together in unison. They mixed it up, but here's, here's one of the, the common prayers of confession that we would pray. Most merciful God, we confess we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we've left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will, walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Now, at first I thought this was a bit authentic, inauthentic, ritualistic, and just, just weird. Just weird to pray a prayer with the church, people sitting all around you. But as the weeks and months went on, things changed for me, in my opinion, of this ritual. There were times when I went to church, for example, that I didn't feel myself to be as much of a sinner as I really was. I was feeling good about myself, doing well. But as you can see in this prayer, you can't get very far with that idea. I was reminded that sin covers thoughts, words, and deeds, and not just things you're supposed to do, uh, but things you've left undone. So not, not just wrong things you've done, but good things you've left undone. But on the flip side, there were other times when I came into church knowing I was a sinner and very weary in my sin, almost not even wanting to go to church at all, ashamed to come before God. Perhaps I hadn't even been praying in my private life because of my shame. But of course, I didn't have a choice of whether or not to pray when I went to church. The prayer of confession was coming up. We all would say it together. Could I really sit there and not say it aloud with people sitting right next to me? So despite my weariness and despite my shame, and despite how long I had gone confessing my sin to God that week, I would pray with the church. And in that, I would be reminded of 
the first lines there, my most merciful God. And that he has mercy on me and forgives me. Why? Not because I prayed a prayer, but for the sake of his beloved son. For the sake of Jesus. Not for my sake or anyone else's, but for the sake of his beloved son. Reciting a written prayer like that wasn't inauthentic. It actually transformed my inauthenticity as a Christian. It wasn't dry ritualism, but it became a life-giving rhythm that always reshaped me however I was coming into church. And it wasn't weird. It soon became a beautiful thing that I look fondly on. How much more then would praying the Psalms be for us, which are Holy Spirit-inspired prayers for God's people? It should be no wonder that Jesus prayed the Psalms as his own prayers. Praying the Psalms was a lifeline for his soul, carrying him through the darkest moments of his life on the cross. The Gospel of Matthew records Jesus praying Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In his final words before death was a quote. It wasn't even his own words. It was a quote from the Psalms, as Luke records, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Psalm 31, 5. Imagine going that way. Imagine that's the way you go. Psalm 31, 5. In one sense, you can view the sermon series then that we're going to be in on the Psalms as a sermon series on how to be more like Jesus. Because Jesus prayed the Psalms. How much more should we? What transformation in life and beauty might we find when we do? But second, the Psalms point to Jesus. Jesus prayed the Psalms, but the, and the Psalms point to Jesus. It's another reason why I believe the Psalms are vital for our spiritual life. The Psalms point to Jesus so much, in fact, that when Jesus and the apostles were proving to people that Jesus was the Messiah they most often quoted the Psalms out of all the New Testament. Walking with some disciples after his resurrection, Jesus said to them, Luke 24, everything must be fulfilled that was written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Well, what did the Psalms say about Jesus? Listen to how one pastor summarized it. Walking along with these disciples, quote, he may have reminded them how in Psalm 2, he was spoken of as the begotten son before whom all must bow. And how his resurrection was foreshadowed in Psalm 16. Or maybe how Psalm 22 provides a prophetic picture of this innocent one whose hands and feet were pierced by evildoers. Yet how in Psalm 110, he is exalted at the right hand of the father to forever serve as priest and king. Surely from Psalm 118, how he is the stone that the builders rejected that would become the cornerstone on whom God would build his church. And that's the end of the quote there. So the Psalms are vital for our spiritual life because the Psalms point us to Jesus, the one who made a way to be able to come to God in prayer at all. That's why we pray in Jesus' name. We, we're coming to God, not on our own merits, but through Jesus, who has earned his place before the Lord and gives that to us as a gift of grace because of his sacrifice on the cross, because Jesus lived a perfectly obedient life before God, died a sacrificial death as payment for our sin, and was raised to an incorruptible life Anyone who comes to faith in him and repentance can freely receive the benefits and the standing that he earned because of his life before God. Despite our sin, we can be forgiven and reconciled to God as a dearly loved son or daughter on the basis of God's beloved son, Jesus Christ, whom the Psalms speak of. As the author of Hebrews writes, we therefore can boldly come before the throne of God's grace in prayer because of Jesus' life and death and resurrection, the apostle John can say, if we but confess our sin, God will be faithful and just to forgive us our sin. So if you're not a Christian here today, first, 
we're, we're excited that you're here. You're welcome, you're welcome anytime to come. But I want you to know that because of Jesus, you can talk to God. When you look to Jesus, repent of your sin and receive him in faith, you can be reconciled to God. And to the Christians here, to God's people, let us praise God for giving us the Psalms to bring life to our prayers and to continually point us to the one who made it possible for us to pray at all. The Psalms are vital for our spiritual health. Now let's close by seeing how. How is it that they strengthen our spiritual life? How does it bring strength? When I was young, I was maybe five years old and I prayed this prayer. I remember kneeling on my bed, folding my hands. I remember the blanket that I laid on. Jesus, please come into my heart. Amen. But after I prayed that prayer and said, amen, nothing magical happened. The windows didn't burst open with a gush of wind. An angel didn't appear to me. So I prayed it again. I thought something must be wrong. But after the second time, nothing happened. So I prayed it a third time. And still, nothing happened. So I called it quits and thought, this isn't working. Prayer can be frustrating sometimes, can't it? It often seems easier to quit than to just keep on praying for many reasons. For example, our prayers can be quite thin. We, get, we can get tired of asking God for things, like a grocery list. I mean, we know asking God for things is part of prayer, but it just seems so thin. So we're tempted to quit. Or our prayers can be just aimless. Wandering from thought to thought without much direction at all. We either repeat a routine prayer or get lost in thought, trailing off to prayerless thoughts in prayerless places. Having direction in prayer can be hard to come by with no guidance. So we are tempted to quit. Or our prayers can be just simply inconsistent. They become a sporadic moment here and there rather than a habit that we practice all the time. They become a place we go for emergencies only rather than a place we visit regularly. For many of us, we only remember to pray when we're desperate or afraid. So feeling the guilt of inconsistency, it just seems easier just to quit praying altogether. But again, let us thank God for giving us the Psalms to teach us and lead us in prayer despite our reasons to want to quit. They lead our prayers to greater maturity, profoundly strengthening our spiritual life. Here's just three ways that they do that. There are many more, but three ways the Psalms strengthen our spiritual life and give us the strength to keep praying. First, fullness. Have you ever heard somebody else pray and thought, oh man, I wish I could pray like that. They seem so spiritual. They seem like they really know God. How do they get that way? Well, when we pray along with the Psalms, we don't have that problem. We're not limited by our personal emotional makeup or our personal experience in depth and years praying in order to have a rich and full prayer life when we pray with the Psalms. For example, if you feel exhausted by the cares of life, pray Psalm 42. Ben preached it a couple weeks ago. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why does so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Did you know you can even pray if you feel rejected by the Lord? Psalm 94. Blessed is the one you discipline, Lord, the one you teach from your law. You grant them relief from days of trouble till a pit is dug for the wicked. For the Lord will not reject his people. He will never forsake his inheritance. By the way, you are the inheritance that he will never forsake. What about if joy is hidden from you? 
and you don't have any praise for the Lord on your heart, Psalm 36, 136 won't let you get away with that. It will put praise for the Lord on your lips. Give thanks to the Lord for his good. You know it. His love endures forever. And it keeps this uh, re resounding praise for the Lord. To him who alone does great wonders, his love endures forever. And keeps going on and on. What about if you feel too embarrassed or ashamed to come before the Lord in prayer? Well, Psalm, 40, Psalm 145 will rebuke you. Say, how dare you, child of God, be ashamed to come to your father. Psalm 145, 8, because the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love. So we are not limited by our emotional makeup or personality or experience praying when we pray with the Psalms. Second, Psalms give us direction. Have you ever felt this way about prayers? Uh, my prayers seem so thin and clumsy. I don't really know what to pray or where I'm going. When I pray, I often get stuck praying the same shallow routine of prayer or get lost in other thoughts. By the way, this is very autobiographical. Um, I'm just letting you know, like, just how I feel. I, I, I didn't get any um, special insights from one of you. This is just a human problem. I get lost in other thoughts when I pray. I lose direction. I feel aimless. Not so when we pray with the Psalms. The Psalms direct our prayer life. We're guided in prayer. Despite the social awkwardness of talking with a God we may not know that well. Remember Romans 8.26. The Spirit helps us in our weaknesses when we do not know what we ought to pray for. The Spirit himself intercedes for us. Perhaps it could be. One way the Spirit does that is by leading us in prayer through his own Spirit-inspired psalms that he's given for his people. One uh, constructive thing that marriage has brought to my life is having a wife direct me to relate to others in a way that I would otherwise overlook. Whether it's to reach out to someone on a special day or to thank someone for something they did or to ask uh, a new acquaintance, better questions. The fact is, without my wife's direction, I would have never thought to say those things. The Psalms direct our prayer life. Rather than searching for a particular type of Psalm to pray, just pray the next one. And you will often say, I would have never thought to say that. And it trains us over time how it is we ought to pray. And it even trains us what to say what we never thought we could say in prayer. We're trained that we can say things we never thought God would have wanted to hear. So we're not left wondering what to pray or how to pray, nor are we ever stuck in a shallow routine prayer when we pray with the Psalms. Third and final way the Psalms strengthen our spiritual lives through prayer is consistency. Have you ever felt this way about prayer? My prayer life comes and goes depending on how I'm doing. I can be caught up in a prayerless drought depending on how I feel. In my prayer journals, one way I pray is I write and I always date it. And it always kills me to see how long it's been since I'd come to my prayer journal. It's not like I don't pray outside of my journal, but still, man, I'm not very consistent. Not so when we pray the Psalms. The Psalms sustain our prayer life. One of the earliest memories that I have of my grandfather is uh, going upstairs uh, to his bathroom and seeing his weekly medicine organizer. That's the first time I'd ever seen something like that. I didn't think much of it. Other than I assumed, well, this must be something that old people need uh, because they can't remember to take their medicine. Maybe I was six or seven years old. But it was the very week that I began taking a multivitamin in my 20s that I realized I need to get one of those things. I'm not consistent taking my medicine. Grandpa was onto something. The Psalms are like a medicine organizer for your life. 
When we pray the Psalms, we're not left to the whims of our memory or feelings or whether or not we want to pray. In this, uh, we receive something from the Psalms that no medicine could do for us. We are brought into the presence of God to be restored by His Spirit and given strength for the day. We are not left to ourselves and whether or not we might have a consistent prayer life or be disciplined enough or feel a desire to pray when we pray with the Psalms. So thanks be to God for giving us the Psalms. Amen? As they bring vitality and strength to our spiritual lives. We're not left to ourselves when it comes to praying to God. Jesus himself leads us in prayer by example to come to these streams of water as they turn uh, us back in faith to him as our Savior. So for the next five weeks, we're going to look at a different chapter of the Psalms and how that actually helps us pray a particular line of the Lord's Prayer as an example. But let's close together, just praying together. Psalm 34. So let's read this together as, as our prayer as we close. Psalm 34. Let's read it together. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you holy people. For those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry. But those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Amen. Let's, let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for this evening, this, this humble evening that we've come together to just receive our daily bread of worship. We thank you for the transforming work it does on us. How often we overlook it. How often we underestimate when your people gather together for worship. May this become a habit for our life and may this uh, lead us into a week of prayer depending on you for all good things. And thank you so much for giving us the Psalms to lead us in prayer, to walk us by the hand through the richness and the depths of prayer. Thank you for Christ, for sending him to reconcile us to yourself for him leading us in an example, not just as a formality, but something that he really depended on himself. And we pray this all through Christ. Amen.
we've come into God's presence from his call to worship, God's people, you get to go out with God's blessing. This comes from Romans chapter 15, verses 5 and 6. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Jesus Christ had, so, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You are dismissed.